Hello, fighting game fans. Another year has come and gone, and as we usher in 2024, I decided to do something I've been thinking about for several years now. For the longest time, I've wanted to do a video looking back at fighting games over the previous year. I wanted to do this because despite how big the FGC and fighting games have become, I still feel like they don't get that same celebration that lots of other genres get. And every year on YouTube, I see people looking back at the previous year of games, but even the big FGC YouTubers only really cover the core games. Like, this year I guarantee you that most people covering fighting games are probably just going to talk about Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and maybe Grand Blue Fantasy. But there's so much more to cover beyond that. So yeah, I've been wanting to do something that actually looks back at the fighting game releases and stories of the previous year, and now is a great time to start because 2023 was jam-packed with fighting games. So today, we're going to look back at everything that I can think of from the previous year. Except for one big exception. I am going to go through the year chronologically covering the releases and news stories of every single month, and if a brand new game gets announced, I'm going to cover it. But if a game was already announced and we just got updates on it, yeah, we can skip that. I'm super excited for Tekken 8, but Tekken 8 was announced in 2022, and then every few weeks this year, we got brand new announcements about it, and yeah, I'm going to skip all that, because otherwise half this video would just be, so Asuka got added to the game, Raven's back, Yoshimitsu's back, Kuma's back. Yeah, I'm not going to cover updates unless they're really shocking. But now that that clarification is out of the way, let's look back at all the fighting game highs and lows of the past 12 months. January kicks off with the re-release of a game that I honestly thought we'd never see again, because despite the fact that old school fighting game fans speak highly of it, it's so obscure that I figured it would be lost forever to the sands of time. I'm talking about The Breakers Collection, which was released by Brazilian studio Cubite Interactive. Cubite has been making a big push to get their foot into the fighting game community, and you know what? Picking up these older fighters that have been abandoned but still have a fan base and re-releasing them for the very first time in decades, or in this case, for the very first time ever on home consoles? Yeah, that definitely gets you some respect from me. This collection contains the original Breakers and Breakers Revenge, and I am so glad that they didn't do the sleazy move of charging people for each of them and releasing them separately, because Breakers Revenge is just Breakers with a balance patch and one new character. That does not justify splitting them up. But at the same time, they could have said, yeah, Breaker's Revenge is just a better version of Breaker's, let's only release that. Because despite how similar they are, they were separate games, and video game preservation is important. So even if there is no reason at all for Breaker's to exist with Breaker's Revenge out there, it is nice to have them both preserved. Now this was my first time ever playing these games, and I can say, there's nothing really special about Breakers, there's nothing to it that makes you say, oh, this is the game that did this. There's no special interesting mechanics or gimmicks that make it stand out, it's just a standard right down the middle fighting game. But it's a really darn good one. Yeah, it doesn't do anything unique, but what it does, it does really well. The hits feel really good, the combos are simple but rewarding, sure, some of the inputs are still that mid-90s fighting game wackiness, but there are a few games from this time period where the combat was this fun. I'm very thankful to Cubite for allowing players a chance to pick this game up again, they're starting the year off on a good note. Next, Framemakers finally went into early access. A few years ago, we did a builder roster where I talked about how much I wanted a good indie platform fighting crossover game, kind of like the indie version of Smash. And so many people reached out and said, what about Framemakers? Have you heard of Framemakers? And I'll admit, no, I hadn't heard of Framemakers, actually. Back in 2020, Framemakers launched a Kickstarter to create their own platform fighter made up of several characters from indie games, and its $46,000 goal was surpassed, hitting over 300000 So yeah, this was a big success. And now, in January of this year, it finally launched in early access. And I'll admit, I never really liked talking about a game in early access because you never know how much the game will change before it eventually releases. You never know what complaints you might have about the game that end up getting fixed along the way, so you don't want to say anything too negative about the game, but you also don't want to reward anything in the game because it might get patched out. But so far, the game feels pretty good. Seems like a good start. Admittedly, I haven't played much of it, but I have played enough to look forward to the eventual full release. And the last thing to note from January was that Shingo kicked off Season 2 of King of Fighters 15. 
Glad to see Shingo return. After doing our King of Fires retrospective, I started to like him, but also I think it's great that a character who wasn't in KOF 14 was added because one of the complaints that I heard a lot of people making about KOF 15's roster was that there were too many characters carried over from the last game, which is true, but I hate saying it, that's kind of where fighting games are going from here on out. Fighting games used to have way more interesting rosters simply because they came out so quickly. When KOF had annual games, of course you could throw in there whoever you want, because if a staple for the series wasn't there, just wait a year. But now the games take five, six, seven years to come out, yeah, you can't exactly leave out the staples. You can leave out one or two, but the other 20 have to be in there. Do I like this? No, but that's how it is. And because of that, unless a new KOF can have 70 characters in it, you're going to have people complaining, where's this character? So while it would have been far easier for SNK to port over a KOF 14 character since they already had some of their framework ready to go, they took the time to get a fan favorite character who had been missing from the past few installments. I'm very happy to see that. Next, moving into February, going to quickly talk about some DLC, Von Stroheim was added to JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle R. But I'm going to be real with you, JoJo fans. JoJo got DLC all throughout this year, and I'm not really going to talk much about any of them because I played this game when it originally came out on the PS3, and when it was announced to be coming back, I was happy. I always liked seeing an older game get to live again, and when I found out that they were adding brand new content and brand new characters, I thought, that's awesome, good for the JoJo fans. But I had no real interest in returning to this. It's a good game, I actually think it's pretty solid, I had fun with it all those years ago, but it was never one of those games that made me say, I need to return to this. Also, I will admit, I haven't seen JoJo's past part four, so I don't know any of the later characters, but all the characters I do recognize who they have added, yeah, none of them really spoke to me. Like, I love part two, it's my favorite part in JoJo's, and Von Stroheim is from part two, and I had zero interest in playing as Von Stroheim. Then it was finally revealed this month that Mortal Kombat 12 was going to release this year, and by revealed, I mean it was leaked during a Warner Brothers earnings call. Man, I feel so bad for the Netherrealm guys. You can tell they were purposely waiting as long as possible to reveal this game. They wanted to shock the world when they revealed it, like, hey, not only is it real, it's almost here! But then Warner Brothers had to reassure everyone, don't worry, a big money maker is coming this year. And they spilled the beans. Although I will say, Ed Boon had the best response to it on Twitter. Kudos to him on handling this like a champ. Next up, maybe the most unique indie fighter of the year, your only move is hustle. I honestly don't think I would have even known this was a fighting game if someone didn't tell me it was, because this is a turn-based fighting game which is a concept my brain refuses to grasp. I heard that and I thought, a turn-based fighting game? That doesn't make any sense. But hey, that's indie ingenuity for you. So I decided to check the game out and after playing it, yeah, I get it. This is absolutely a fighting game. You take your turn doing each move, but it's not like an RPG where you just hit attack or defend. No, you can attack with highs, lows, kicks, punches. You can dash, super dash, backdash, jump, heck, you can even choose the angle and the height of your jump. It's actually crazy how much they let you do in here, but your opponent is doing the same thing at the exact same time. Let me put it to you like this. Don't think of this as a turn-based fighting game. Think of it as a fast-paced, crazy, over-the-top fighting game where everyone has a time freeze ability. In a single-player mode, you can't really do much, it's basically just a training mode. So I went online to try and see some actual matches, and I have to point this out. I thought, oh, this is a niche indie game that's been out for 10 months, nobody is going to be playing it anymore. Turns out a lot of people are still playing it. It was insane how many people I found online. If you are at all curious about this game, don't worry, there is an audience, and that audience is active. However, I decided not to try any matches myself because I still didn't fully grasp the concept, so I wanted to watch other people play it first, and after watching some matches, damn, it's actually really cool seeing people try to read each other in this game. Seeing people who knew what they were doing playing this game made me realize this is a game for those people who are all about reading your opponent 
and trying to figure out what they're going to do next. I saw one match where the momentum from one action was going to send someone flying down to hit their opponent, but then both players selected their moves and the opponent dashed ahead and then turned around to counterattack the opponent as they came down to do their attack, but they ended up hitting nothing because the first player never dropped down. They knew the opponent would try to counterattack their attack, so they dove at an angle to avoid the counter. If your favorite thing about fighting games is just trying to read your opponent, and you want something that is going to challenge you and force you to think so hard that eventually you can see through time, pick up your only move is hustle. Also, I have to throw this out there. I love that you can do all this crazy stuff that doesn't really look all that nuts. It's just one little move at a time. But then you can hit the replay button and it shows you everything in the match at normal speed and it's the craziest thing you'll ever see in a fighting game. It kind of reminds me of what it's like to edit a large video where I think, oh, this is just tedious. I'm only moving ahead a little bit at a time. But then I play back the thing that I just edited and I'm like, damn, that's what I just made? God bless the crazy minds who thought this game up. And the last big story of February, speaking of really unique fighting games that don't feel like fighting games, but totally are fighting games, Rumbleverse, the Battle Royale fighting game, shut down. And man, this one hurts. When this game was first announced, I had zero interest in it because it's 2023. Who the hell is still making new Battle Royales? Don't get me wrong, Battle Royales are still big, but only the Battle Royales that everyone has agreed they like. I can't name the last new Battle Royale that made everyone say, this is it. This is the new game everyone is talking about. There have been good new Battle Royales, just yeah, none of them really succeed. If you're a game developer and someone says, hey, we want to hire you to make a Battle Royale, I'm not saying don't take the job, I'm just saying realize that after a year, your game probably won't exist anymore. And sure enough, that's what happened here. Rumbleverse, a fighting game battle royale, shut down after only six months. And as I said, I didn't care about this game when it was announced. I knew it was from Iron Galaxy, so I was hoping that would be a success because that's a good studio. I want to see them succeed and do well. But I had no interest in playing it. But when I found out it was going to be shut down, I decided, you know what, before it's gone forever, let me check it out and... Well damn, this might be the most fun Battle Royale I've ever played in my life. For starters, yeah, it is a fighting game. It uses the same mechanics and basic principles of fighting games. I even saw posts going around Twitter of people talking about how this game made them appreciate the intricacies of fighting games, which is cool to see. It made them understand things like spacing and frame data and advantage. So it takes those core principles of a fighting game, but then they figured out how to make it work in a giant massive world where you have to run and jump around like it's a platformer. The best way I can describe this is it feels like it's an arena fighter, just with a couple dozen other people fighting at the exact same time. And it had this fun, upbeat personality to it. It felt like you were shoved into a Warner Brothers cartoon. And there were little tiny details hidden in every single corner of the map. There were so many times that I didn't even want to fight. I just wanted to check out all the billboards and statues. I love that they made a whole city dedicated to fighting. And they slapped that concept everywhere. And the announcer is so fun. I never turned him off. I always wanted to hear him keep talking about what was going on. Everything in this game was just charming with shockingly solid combat. But when you take the niche audience of fighting games and then merge it with a new genre where new titles are dying left and right, and then mix that with an art style that... Okay, listen, I like the way it looks, but I totally get why like 80% of people would be turned off by this. And then put all of that under the epic game company who demands that you become a top 10 hit or else you're canceled. And yeah, this game was dead on arrival. It never had any chance. And again, I have to stress, I love this game. I made sure to get every single trophy in it before it shut down. And I'm actually kind of mad that they didn't give this thing a platinum trophy because I wish I could have added that to my collection. And I actually got choked up at the send off message that they posted on Twitter. This game was something really special made with passion and love. But none of that is going to make an audience appear out of thin air. 
You want to know how small the audience was for this game? I only saw one other YouTuber make a dedicated video on this game, not just footage of them playing matches, but a video talking all about the ins and the outs of the game. It was this guy named Yakko. I watched his video, it's great, it sums up a lot of what makes this game special, but I kept looking at his character and eventually it hit me. Wait a minute. I played against him. For like five matches in a row. And then when the game was shutting down, I kept seeing people posting footage of their games on Twitter, and I looked at them and I realized, wait, I was in that match! I recognize those guys! That's how small this audience was. Everyone left playing it was barely able to fill up a single game. If you were playing Rumbleverse in its final days, you knew everyone else playing Rumbleverse in its final days. But even if the game didn't have a large audience, I'm still crossing my fingers that Iron Galaxy can bring it back in some way, or at least make some version of the game where you can set up a private server and then host it yourself. Because even if this is something that only a handful of people want to keep playing, it would be nice if those people could still play it. Well, there you go, Rumbleverse shut down. Sad news, but hopefully the rest of the year we'll see some positive uplifting stories and nothing else will be shut down. Hey, what's happening in March? Yeah, there's one I'm not sad about, though. Yeah, so in March, Multiverses, the winner of 2022's Fighting Game of the Year Award, something that happened just three months before this, announced it would be closing up shop. At least, for now. Yeah, remember, Multiverses never officially launched. You might not have realized that, seeing as how they had season passes and DLC, and they charged you for those season passes and DLC. Which to me is like a restaurant asking you what you would like for dessert, but they never actually gave you your main course because they never actually opened, and this actually isn't a restaurant, it's a barbershop, which is now closed for renovations. Did that sense not make any sense? Guess what? Neither did Multiverses' rollout plans! I do not have time to go into all the problems with multiverses, so let's just hit up the big one. It's clear from day one, either there was no plan for how this game would be released, or there was a plan and somebody at Warner Brothers stepped in and made them throw that plan out. This game launched as an open beta. Not early access. Early access is when the game is just going to exist forever as a work in progress state and slowly build things up from there. No, this was an open beta. You know, the kind of thing that is only meant to last for a limited time. You put out a beta, see how people react, then you close things down and go and work on everything that you learn from that beta. Nothing wrong with that. Except that Multiverses is beta, never had an end date. They put out the beta, but that beta was just supposed to last forever. So it was like an early access, but it wasn't. And here's the thing. A game like Multiverses shouldn't have an early access. Early access is for games that want to build up press over time. You know, start small, but get some good word of mouth going. Multiverses is a game crossing over every Warner Brothers franchise under the sun. It's the biggest collection of media properties outside of Disney. This isn't a, hey, let's just put out there a small thing and let it grow over time kind of game. This is a, we kick the door down and punch you in the face with everything we've got and blow your mind right out of the gate kind of game. And that's why a beta would have worked great. You put out what you have now and just give people a taste and you make people think, oh, so this is what we got now, then what will we have when the game comes out? But the beta never ended. It just stuck around with no end date, and because of that, this stopped being a beta, and it just became the official game. Over the months, I remember so many people confused over this, and people kept asking, so is the game out? Is this it? In fact, at one point, Multiverse's Steam page said it was an early access, and then they just took that down like it had officially released and nobody knew what was happening. And to make matters worse, they started monetizing it. They threw in their season passes and other microtransactions. And hey, it's a free game. Microtransactions make sense. Except that it's not a free game. It's a free beta for an upcoming free game. Putting season passes in there kind of implies that the game is already here because it implies that you're going to have it exist for seasons. 
And as for the content in the game, it was fine for a beta. It gave everyone an idea of what the combat would be like, and that's all you need for a beta. But when this stopped being a beta and just became the game itself, it needed so much more. Let me put it to you like this. If you show someone the framework for a house and it makes them say, oh, that's going to be nice to live in. But then you start charging them rent for that framework and it makes them think, wait, so is this my house? Are you done? You haven't really done anything to it in a while. Is it finished? I can't live in this. Where are the doors? Where's the roof? And that brings us to the big story that broke just a few weeks before this announcement. When Multiverses first launched, it broke a record for the most people playing a fighting game on Steam at any one time, with over 140,000 people all playing at a single moment. Normally, a fighting game is lucky if it gets 4,000 people playing at the same time, let alone 140,000. But then in February, a story broke that the current number of people playing the game was less than 1% of that all-time peak. And yeah, that was some pretty bad news. How does a game in less than a year lose over 99% of its player base? Well, a few things about that. First thing we have to make clear is that no, this game didn't lose 99% of its player base because that 140,000 number is massively inflated. Multiverses is a free-to-play game, but it's also, for lack of a better term, a spectacle. This is a game that advertised itself as, you can have Game of Thrones characters teaming up with Bugs Bunny. Isn't that wild? Superman gets to team up with the Iron Giant. You all saw that movie. You all cried when he said, Superman. And now you can have the two of them actually team up. And did we mention Ultra Instinct Shaggy is in here? Yeah, you know that meme all you kids think is hilarious? We made it real. That running gag on Twitter now actually exists. And yeah, that made a lot of people jump into this game just to check it out. But not to check out the gameplay, just to check out Game of Thrones characters and Bugs Bunny and Batman and Ultra Instinct Shaggy. They never actually wanted to play the game itself. This is the equivalent of saying, hey, you want to see the world's largest ball of twine? It's free. And then you say, oh, uh, okay, sure, why not? Then all of a sudden, there are news stories breaking saying, this just in, everyone loves twine now. No, dude, it's not that everyone loves twine. It was just a weird novelty, and we all figured we'd check it out because we had some free time, and we were curious to see what it looked like. So yeah, there were 140,000 people all online at the same time, but 140,000 people didn't actually want to play this game. They just kind of wanted to see all the memes. But, even factoring that in, yeah, the free-to-play nature of the game did ensure that a lot of people who were even mildly curious about checking out the game itself now got a chance to jump into it. So, even if that number wasn't going to be 140,000, it was still going to be high no matter what. So that does still raise the question, why did this number drop so much? Well, Multiverses was obviously trying to get in on the success of Smash Bros. A platform fighter crossing over beloved franchises Heck yeah, it seems like a slam dunk. Except here's the problem. Do you know what the vast majority of Smash players love? The single player content. Smash Bros. sells incredibly well, largely because it's not a game about taking on other people online in competitive ranked matches. No, well over 90% of the people who play Smash Bros. Just want to take on the arcade tower, or the spirit battles, or whatever the big new single player content is. Do you know what Multiverses didn't have? Single player content! It took them months to add an arcade ladder to this game, and when they did, it was terrible. You got nothing for beating it, and the final boss was just the green reindeer dog, but now he was big. But as bad as this was, like I said, before that, the single player mode was practically nothing. So that 90% of the Smash audience that plays that game for the single player content didn't have anything to do in a game trying to appeal to the Smash audience. But again, that would have been fine for a beta. A beta is just supposed to show you what the game is like and give you a taste of it. You check it out and say, hey, that's cool, and then it's gone, and you find yourself wishing that you could play it again, and thinking about what could possibly be in the game when it officially releases with all the bells and whistles, and you start getting yourself hyped for that big official release. But as I said, 
This game didn't do that. The beta never ended. We never got that moment to think, gee, I can't wait to see what this game will be like when the full release comes out. Instead, we found ourselves thinking, oh my god, is this the actual full release? And I got a theory on this. I will gladly say this with my full chest. This was not how the game's release was supposed to go. Warner Brothers right now is a clown car being driven by pure greed. And I guarantee you, this game was only supposed to be in beta for a limited amount of time. Maybe like two, three weeks tops. But then those stories came out about all the records it was breaking. Over a hundred thousand people all playing the game at the exact same time. The most successful fighting game launch ever. And then the higher ups at Warner Brothers burst into the multiverse's office and said, Hey, whoa, what do you think you're doing? Are you about to take this thing down? You're not going to shut down this beta. No, no, no. Did you see those numbers? That's money just ready to be brought in. Keep it open and unleash the battle pass. Then two months after the beta launch, they put out their first battle pass. So now you got the poor developers who already had to work on the final version of the game, but now they also had to make sure that they had a season pass of content continuously being pumped out as well as brand new costumes and seasonal events. Yeah, this was never the plan. It clearly had to have been changed after opening the beta. And when they finally shut the beta down in June, I saw so many people saying, well, this was always the plan. Why is everyone so mad? It's a beta. It was always the plan to shut it down eventually. So in case anyone still thinks this was all according to plan, Season 1 of Multiverses released 5 new characters. Season 2 released 1 new character and then announced it would be shutting down a few weeks after the story about its declining player base. Hell no, this was not the plan! The plan was to shut the beta down after a few weeks. You know, like a beta test! But that plan was thrown out the window and these poor developers had to keep this thing up and running to please the higher ups for the next 8 months until they just couldn't do it anymore. And sadly, if they had closed the beta down after just a few weeks, this game would re-release and it would probably be a massive success. But now? Dude, I seriously don't know anyone who is still excited for this because everyone who was excited for it spent eight months grinding away at a game with almost no content until they just had a bad taste in their mouth and didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And don't get me wrong, I'm not ruined for this game to fail. No, these developers have worked hard on this. They clearly cared about it. I want to see them get a big win out of this. I'm just saying I think Warner Brothers came in here and did the one thing that Warner Brothers knows how to do these days and shot themselves in the foot. And sadly, it might be too late and it pisses me off to think that something like this could have happened all because the guys at the top wanted to make more money. So, yeah. Hey, in other news, Black Dahlia got added to Skullgirls. That's kind of cool. Glad that game is still getting some new characters. And Kicho Nijimura got added to JoJo's. Weird character to add. He was only like three episodes of the show. And speaking of weird developments, Fighting EX Layer this month showed off some new footage of a version of the game that featured the characters moving in three dimensions and there were some new mechanics that were being shown off and there was pretty much no other information provided. And this happened like 10 months ago, and there's been no updates or news from the game since. What the hell is happening with this thing? Anyway, on to April. Now this month was all about DLC. First up, Badman came to Guilty Gear Strive. I had zero interest in this character. I don't care what kind of crazy stuff Bedman could do in the last Guilty Gear. I don't care what his story was. I don't care that he's supposed to be this insanely powerful being that makes even the mightiest characters quake in their boots. He just never interested me. So I didn't care that Bedman, now with a question mark, got added to the game until later in the year when for our annual charity stream I gave him a try and you know what? He is insanely fun. I love playing as him. Although I just realized, is Bedman now referring to the original Bedman's consciousness inside the bed? Is it now his little sister or is it both of them? Well, either way, they're a ton of fun. 
They have this mechanic where after each move, a secondary attack gets primed that will go off on its own after a certain amount of time, which means setting up combos for them requires some big brain energy. Or you can just throw out whatever moves you want and then you go in there and you end up surprising yourself with what you end up accidentally juggling together. Guess which tactic I used. Then Kim Capuan got added to KOF 15. I mentioned before that these days fine games can really only afford to leave out one or two stables from each game. And for KOF 15, that stable was Kim. This was the first time that he had never been in a King of Fighters, so it does feel good to have him back. And it feels good to see Kim's pants back. Yeah, the joke with Kim is that his pants are always gorgeously animated, but then KOF 14 had such bad animation that his pants were firmly pressed and low with starch. But now he's got a new look and his pants are fluttering around like they always should have. KOF 15 now feels complete. And the last DLC character for April, Stronghoof joined them's fighting herds. I'll admit I haven't checked him out yet, but hey, they add All Might to them's fighting herds. That's cool. No pun intended. He's a big majestic reindeer who summons out ice weapons. I dig that the first two characters for them's fighting herds DLC season have both been big bulky boys to help spice up the roster. Next up, something literally nobody had on their bingo card for 2023. The game company International Game System, or IGS for short, a studio that hasn't exactly been a huge name in the industry, put out a collection of some of their older titles from the 90s. Why am I covering that? Because that collection include the first ever home release of Marshall Masters, a super hidden gem from 1999. I never saw this game in arcades back in the day, I didn't get exposed to it until Wooly vs did a video on it, but after hearing about this game, I did play an emulated version of it and yeah, this game is great. Just like Breaker's Revenge, it doesn't really do anything unique, but what it does, it does incredibly well. The animation is smooth with gorgeous sprites, great combo potential, your basic attacks feel really good to pull off. This is absolutely one of those games that deserves way more attention, and now for the very first time, people can play it at home. And people are mad about it. Okay, that's not fair to say. It makes it sound like people are ranting and raving in the streets, but I have seen a handful of fans of the game saying this port isn't exactly what they want. It's locked at 16 by 9 ratio, and fans of older fighting games from the 90s tend to not really like it when you forcefully stretch their screen out. A lot of people complain that they made the graphics look washed out and fuzzy, but the biggest problem is that people say the input has a very noticeable delay. Apparently, there is some strong input lag, but not enough that it makes the game unplayable, it doesn't make the game bad, but it is enough to make this a disappointing port. Then, heading into the indie fighting game news, there's an upcoming game called Frostfire that I've been following for a while. The developers have been updating their progress for years now on Twitter, and I've been really interested with it. It's got this 2D artwork that kind of looks like it came from your high school sketchbook, but I kind of love that. It gives it a lot of homegrown charm and personality. Well, in April, they opened a Patreon, which allowed people to get their hands on an early build of the game, so I finally got to see someone besides the devs trying it out, and it looks pretty good. I saw a couple of their fans posting up some really cool combo videos online, so you know what? I'm pretty excited for this title now. If you haven't checked out Frostfire yet, then go and give them a follow. And lastly, God of Rock released in April, and I was very curious about because Modus Games had been advertising this all over the place as being a cross between rhythm games and fighting games. And hey, as I said with Rumbleverse and your only move is Hustle, you can totally merge fighting games with other genres and styles and get really creative with that premise. But every time that I saw footage of this game, I just saw the rhythm game part. I mean, sure, you had avatars duking it out on the top, but it feels like this was still just a competitive rhythm game where whoever hit the most notes correctly won. And yeah, that's kind of the case. When you miss notes, you take damage. However, you do have special moves, or you can charge up a super, and when you throw those out, white notes will appear on your opponent's board, and that will stumble and trip them up since they can't press those notes. But that's about all there is to the fighting game element. This really is like 95% a rhythm game that just has one mechanic from fighting games. And it's a mechanic that doesn't even really work all that well. Or more accurately, it works way too well. Listen, I'm terrible at rhythm games, can't play them to save my life. So I can't grade this game as a rhythm game fan. 
Although, judging from the Steam reviews, Rhythm Game fans are really mad about the letters scrolling horizontally rather than vertically, so take that for what you will. But I can say this. You know what will really trip you up when you're trying to hit buttons in a correct order in a rhythm game? Having to stop as those letters are scrolling at you at a breakneck speed, so that way you can input the commands for a Hadouken. Yeah, every single time that I stopped to input a special move, I had to take my fingers away from the regular buttons just long enough that I ended up doing damage to myself. But to balance this out, they made the special moves insanely strong. As I said, I stink at rhythm games, so eventually there would come a point where I was just missing everything. I just wasn't hitting a single note. So you know what? I eventually just stopped trying to hit the note, and I just kept spamming the special move inputs, and those special moves alone cleared out almost every enemy no problem. But I will say the game has pretty good presentation. Each character gets a little comic strip intro. They have special dialogue with every other character. Some of the designs are all over the place, but some of them are pretty decent. And they each have big, crazy, flashy special moves. At least I assume they do. Yeah, this is another spot where the rhythm game element takes away from the fighting game element. Because you have your eyes glued to the bottom of the screen. So you probably won't ever notice anything that's going on above you. And that's important for two reasons. For starters, if you're currently being attacked, then you can't do your special moves. But you can't look up to see if you're being attacked because you have to stare at the bottom of the screen. And secondly, your life bar is at the top of the screen, and I swear to you this is true, it wasn't until I was halfway through my second arcade run that I realized, oh, this game has life bars? Because you are so oblivious to anything happening in the top half of the screen in this game. So yeah, I applaud these devs for trying something different, and for trying to pump tons of personality into this game, but I don't think it works. At least, not here. Maybe another dev could take this concept of a fighting rhythm game and make it work, but this one drops the ball in way too many spots. Not enough to call it a terrible game, as I said the art style is fun, and there are some pretty good songs in here, but there's just too many flaws to give it a recommendation. Then in May, we got some more DLC. Sylvie Pala Pala was added to KOF 15. Glad to see her come back. As I say in our KOF retrospective, I didn't care about her at all when I first started playing the game, but the more I learned about her, the more I actually started to dig her. She's actually kind of got an interesting backstory. I know some people were upset about her returning, but... Guys, the first two DLC teams were Rock Howard and Geese Howard, and then they gave you Samurai Showdown. Let the Gremlin fans have their Gremlin. Then Asuka was added to Guilty Gear Strive, and this is a big deal, because for decades now, the big villain of Guilty Gear has been a mysterious figure, simply known as That Man. But That Man has never been playable before. Until now. Yes, Asuka is That Man. At least, kind of, he's like half of That Man, but uh, whatever, he's finally in the game. But this also is a big deal because ever since Guilty Gear Strive launch, we've constantly heard older Guilty Gear fans complaining, saying that the game is too simplified now. They took out all the crazy stuff of the older games. I personally love Strive. It might be my favorite Guilty Gear, and I think it does an amazing job of striking a balance between the insanity of older Guilty Gears while creating something more accessible. But for that audience that did want the pure insanity of older Guilty Gears, it feels like Asuka was made simply to turn to that audience and say, There! Happy? Take this and prepare to have your mind melt. Yeah, Asuka has like 20 different moves they can throw out, but they're all random, but you can shuffle them around so that way they aren't as random, so you have to control the randomness, and you have to know what every single one of those different moves do, but you only have a limited number of them. It's, it's nutty. It's nutty, and it's Guilty Gear, and it's Guilty Gear nuttiness. So, good. I'm glad that the random grab bag character that you need a 200 IQ score to operate is bringing a taste of old Guilty Gear back. And then probably the biggest shocker of May, a brand new game was released completely out of nowhere, and it was for free! Idol Showdown is a fan-made fighting game based around VTubers, and I don't mean it's in the spirit of VTubers or there's parody of VTubers in here. No. Everyone in here is an existing, real VTuber. 
at least I assume. Listen, I'll be real with you. VTubing is one of those worlds I know nothing about. Not because I have anything against it, no, not at all. It's just one of those things that doesn't often pop up on my radar. And I'm bringing that up because I wanted to warn everyone that I cannot judge this game in any way based on how well it captures these streamers. I don't get any of the in-jokes or references, so I can't tell you if this is a good tribute to them. Although I have heard that each of these streamers actually did give their blessing in this game, at least that's what I've heard, but if that's correct, then awesome! Always happy to see bigger creators giving their blessing to fan projects, but because I have no personal connection to this property, I can only judge this game on a mechanical level. How good is it as an actual fighting game? Pretty darn good, actually! It is shocking this is a free game, because if this was made entirely with original characters, they could still have charged like 10 or 20 bucks for it, and I'd gladly tell people to check it out. I picked it up for the very first time during our charity stream this year, and the chat gave me some combos to try out. And I was really impressed with what this game could do. You can link a lot of stuff together without becoming too crazy, there's a really solid balance in here. But then, you can throw in their assist to spice things up even more, and that leads into all kinds of creativity. And this isn't like a lot of other free fighting games where there's just a versus mode. No, there's a good arcade ladder in here. Again, it's not much, but for a free fighting game, it's more than we normally get. But yeah, big tip of the hat to these creators, they made something special, and again, it's free! Now we come to the halfway point of the year, June. First up, JoJo's got another new DLC character, Alternate World Diego. Again, this is way past what I've seen in the series, so I'm not entirely sure, but from what I've been able to gather, this is Dio from an alternate reality, because apparently the main continuity went so far down the timeline that they couldn't go any further, so in order to continue the story, they had to go into an alternate reality and start telling a story in there, and wait a minute, this isn't an anime podcast, why am I going into so many details about this? Uh, there's another version of Dio in the game, that's all you need to know. Also, this was the final character of Season 1, and with it, Bandai Namco announced a second season would be starting up soon. Then, King of Fires added Gainitz as another boss character that you could fight, and just like with Rugal in the previous year, they add him for free. And I love that this is a mode that KOF 15 added and that they keep updating it. I do feel like they could add a little bit more though, like you can cheat out some easy bosses in here. Make a black outfit for Ash, and now you have Dark Ash from KOF 13 as a boss. Make a dark outfit for Kyo, and then you have Kusanagi, Kyo's evil magical clone from KOF 11 as a boss. Give Geese his nightmare skin from the last game, and now you have Nightmare Geese. There's some really easy ways that you could add more bosses into this game without having to program brand new characters. But even if they don't do that, it is still really cool they create Rugal and Gainets for this game, and they add both of them in here for free. But speaking specifically about Gainitz, it feels like SNK had a mission with this character. They heard people saying Rugal was too easy, and yeah, I have to agree with them. We were going to fight Rugal as our big final game to close out this year's charity stream, but then I decided to do a warm-up match against him on day one of the stream to try and hype things up. The plan was I would go up against Rugal on day one, get my butt kicked by him, then on the final day we would close everything out with me going back in there and beating Rugal, and I ended up beating Rugal in the practice match. So yeah, maybe Rugal was a little bit too easy. So instead we decided to close the event out with me fighting Gainitz, and holy crap, even cheesing that fight, it is brutal. In fact, there's a special skin that you're supposed to be able to unlock for Gainitz if you beat him. And I have been told that apparently SNK just gave that skin out for free because so few people could actually beat him that they felt bad about it. So yeah, if you've been complaining that SNK bosses aren't tough anymore, give this a shot. KOF 15 also finally added crossplay, which from what I've heard ended up working very well for this game and ended up fixing its horrible matchmaking. Hey. That's great. Although I repeat, this is just what people have told me. I will be honest with you, I didn't play KOF in June. I also didn't play Multiverses in June because that was the month when that game officially ended its eternal beta, but we already covered that. No, I didn't play KOF 15 in June because June was the worst possible month to release anything even remotely close to a fighting game 
because this was the month that Street Fighter 6 dropped. And holy crap, Street Fighter 6. You guys, Street Fighter 6. We are currently two thirds of the way through our Street Fighter retrospective. We will hopefully be wrapping that up in the first few months of the year. So I'm going to go into more details about the game and how I feel about there, but I don't even think I really need to cover that game that much in this video, because if you play fighting games, you know all about Street Fighter VI. This game was the true return of the king. This was the exact game that Street Fighter needed and took the world by storm in a way that I haven't seen Street Fighter accomplish since Street Fighter IV. Positive praise from almost every single crick. It sold over 2 million copies in its first month, which might make it the best selling Street Fighter ever. Street Fighter IV shipped 2.5 million units in its first month, but back in 2009, ship didn't mean sold because believe it or not, there was once a time in which game stores would actually order extra copies of popular games and not just what people pre-ordered. Shocking, right? So yeah, it's impossible to tell, but this could be the new champ. And the combat is amazing. Every character has so much that they can do. So many ways to interpret them. Variety and expression are two of the key pillars in making a good fighting game, and in Street Fighter VI, those pillars are strong. And a lot of that is because of the drive system. The drive system is the great equalizer in this game because I have seen characters everyone calls low tier being in the top eight of tournaments simply because no matter how bad a character is, the drive system fills in those gaps. This Swiss army knife of a mechanic is loaded with so many options of how to use it. You can use it offensively, you can use it defensively, you can use it to enhance your character's special moves to create an experience that really lets you show off how you want to play. And the game looks amazing. The Battle Hub is one of the best interpretations of an online arcade I've ever seen in a fighting game. The little mini game versus matches are so goofy and fun and they provide the game with some great variety that gives you a brand new way to play it. And the online feels so good and matches go by so fast. You finish a match and you are right into the next one. And World Tour Mode? Listen, I can make an entire video on how good World Tour Mode is. In fact, I did. Here's the card for it popping up right now. I'm not going to waste any more of your time talking about it here. You can just go and watch the video right there. There, enjoy. I'll just say for anybody who didn't watch the video though, yes, the story of World Tour Mode is bad. In fact, it's not just bad, it's non-existent. That is the big glaring problem of World Tour Mode, but it doesn't bother me because there came a moment while playing it that I realized, wait a minute, this isn't a story mode. That's not why this is here at all. World Tour Mode is a training mode and it's probably the greatest training mode that any game has ever created because it's the first training mode that realizes how to teach people to play fighting games. I'll just leave it at that. Again, if you want more details, just go and watch the video. So yeah, Street Fighter VI was an amazing return to form for Capcom fighting games. This is exactly what I could have wanted a Street Fighter game to be. Are there problems with it? Sure, all games have problems, but it has been so long since I have had this much fun with a Street Fighter, and I am so happy to see this game doing so well. Although we will go into details about some of those problems later in the year, because holy cow, some of those problems are rough. Although we're not done talking about Street Fighter just yet, because now we come to July, and the first DLC character drop for the game, Rashid. So glad to see Rashid come back. He was easily my favorite new character from Street Fighter V. Although admittedly, the competition for that spot isn't all that high, but still really dug his character. And I love his new look. I love that they turned him into a streamer because it leans into his personality from the last game while fleshing him out a bit more. I will admit, I haven't really played him all that much simply because over the past couple of years, I've come to realize that I really dig big beefy characters like Zangief and Marissa and Rashid is the polar opposite of Zangief and Marissa, but still very happy to see him come back. However, he wasn't the only DLC character add to a game this month, and we've got some stuff to say about this next one. DNF Duel. Yeah, remember that? DNF Duel finally got their first DLC character a year after the game came out. DNF Duel released in June of 2022. Then in December of 2022, they announced their season pass. 
And then seven months later, the first character finally dropped. Now listen, I'm not going to talk about Spectre or how she plays because we've got something way bigger to talk about, and that's DNF Duel itself. If you've been paying attention to the FGC for the past year, you've heard people talk about how this game tanked. When it came out, it hit a player high of 12,000 people on Steam. Not bad for a brand new title, that's pretty impressive for something like this. It's not as big as like Guilty Gear or Street Fighter, but that's still pretty solid. But then two months later, that number dropped down to less than 200 players, and it's continued to drop ever since. How? How did that happen? How could a game drop so fast and so hard? Well, I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, and Spectre's release is the perfect excuse to bring it up. I've heard so many people offer up their own rationale for why this game dropped off. But every time I hear someone talking about it, it always sounds like they're struggling to piece an excuse together. Even the people who say they have the answer sound unsure about what they're saying, like they're trying to convince themselves of what they're talking about. Oh, the game was too easy to figure out. Everyone found the answers to everything within a month. But it was also too hard to figure out. Nobody had any answers for all the crazy stuff that these characters could do. It was too crazy and over the top, while at the same time not having enough interesting mechanics. Guys, listen, I understand that we all want answers, but not only do the answers people have seem to be all over the place, but literally every complaint I've seen people throw at DNF Duel can be said about dozens of other fighting games that go on to be far more successful. I've even heard people say, oh, the game lost people early on because Swift Master was too broken. Ah, yes, because fighting games never launch with a broken character. Yeah, that's a brand new concept. Clearly, that was the problem. Guys, I think the real answer here is a lot closer to Occam's Razor. The reason why DNF Duel failed is for the exact same reason why about 90% of things fail. Nobody talked about it. And I know somebody is racing right now to say, hey, hold up, a lot of people were talking about. It. Sure, at launch, lots of people were. But DNF wasn't. I want you all to go back to when this game was just being shown off for the first time, to the early reveals. Remember how none of us had any idea what the hell this was? This game's early footage launched like blurry footage of Sasquatch. We all just had to stare at it and go, what the hell? It was? What is this? Are, is there more information on this? No? Okay. This game didn't premiere with some big, amazing presentation. No, just suddenly one day a trailer for something none of us had ever heard of dropped on Twitter, and then like a year went by without another word on it. And that's kind of how DNF continued to run the show for the game's entire lifespan. They just kind of threw something out there and then ran back into the shadows. And I know you might be thinking, well, that only explains why it might not have reached the general audiences. But fighting game YouTubers and streamers and other people within the FGC were talking about, so why didn't that work? Because, and I hate saying this, but because fighting games don't work today like they used to. You can't just put out a game and then hope that the community itself will carry it. That's not how modern day fighting games work. And it became clear early on that DNF didn't know how modern day fighting games work. Don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about 18 or Arc System Works or any of the people who actually made the game. No, I mean the DNF company, the people who paid for the game and thereby made the decisions about things like promotions and support. It became clear early on, they thought fighting games still worked like they did back in the 90s. Step one, release game. Step two, profit. They had no idea that, no, if you want a fighting game to work today, you need to give it constant support, and I don't just mean announcing it's going to be at a tournament. Yes, fighting game YouTubers and streamers did talk about this game at release, but those same content creators have to talk about whatever the big new shiny thing is, and when DNF said, oh, we don't have any plans for this, bye, they had to move on to whatever the next big shiny thing was. Why do you think Street Fighter, after pulling out one of the biggest fighting games in years, still had to have their DLC character launch just one month later? You need to keep people talking about your game or it's going to die. So yeah, the problem with DNF Duel was always that they put out a game and rather than trying to keep people invested in it, they just walked away. 
They put out a patch to fix Swiftmaster and then they disappeared for months before reappearing to say, don't worry, we're working on something. We won't say what that is, but we are working on something. Then several months passed after that and they finally showed off their first DLC character for about three seconds. And then we wouldn't actually see that character for seven more months. That's what did for this game. That's why it failed. These days, if you have a brand new franchise, you have to give it constant support, and I wish that wasn't the case. I wish that you could just make a good game, and then that's all you needed. But that ain't the world that we're living in anymore. And I guarantee you that 18 and Arc System Works kept trying to tell the DNF team this, but they wouldn't listen. That's why the game took so long to get any new DLC. They didn't plan for it. They probably made the game, and then they probably got rid of everyone except for a skeleton crew just to keep the online running. And it wasn't until months later that DNF realized, wait, why isn't anyone playing it anymore? Hold up! Were they right about that DLC stuff? Were we supposed to actually have plans for this game ahead of time? And now, here we are. And hey, I like DNF Duel! I think this game is a ton of fun! I think the characters look really cool, I think the combat is great! That's why it upsets me so much to see this game fail, simply because DNF didn't know what to do. But we'll talk more about this game later in the year, and I'll have more positive stuff to say then. For now though, we move into August, and this was a big month for fighting games because EVO was this month. And one EVO it was! This was the EVO of... Mirror Matches, with so many of the final games coming down to identical fighters and teams. But even though this threatened to make the event feel kinda stale, Street Fighter VI came in here with quite possibly the most hype match I have ever seen at an EVO in my life. The finals of Street Fighter VI this year were insane, and they let me know how special this game is. I love those finals, and I think I spent about half of the top four of Street Fighter standing up and pacing around the living room, breathing heavily and making some kind of a woo sound. Although, speaking of Street Fighter, let's move into some of the announcements from EVO, and I'm going to start by pulling the biggest band-aid off first. Street Fighter announced it would be having a collaboration with the Ninja Turtles, a very cool and surprising reveal considering that Street Fighter doesn't do a lot of crossovers, at least not in-game. Outside of the game, they cross over with everything under the sun, but in-game, they tend to be Street Fighter only. So they announced that your in-game avatar could purchase Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle costumes. Hey, that's cool. That's a nice little touch. They were $15. That's significantly less cool. Now, in all fairness, the Ninja Turtles also just got added to Fortnite, and their pricing is almost the same, so this could be a problem with Nickelodeon. But even with that, this was the first big crack in Street Fighter VI's armor, and after this, it kinda kept spreading. Over the next few months, Capcom kept offering up more exclusive skins. Not for your characters, but for your in-game avatar. And they were priced at around... oh... 20-25 bucks? Just for something you can wear in the lobby. That's insane! Is what someone would say if they haven't been paying attention to Capcom over the past few years. Yeah, I've been saying this for a while now, but when it comes to greedy practices, Capcom is just as bad as any other AAA company. They're like one notch below Ubisoft and Activision. We just try to ignore it because Capcom still makes good games. Wanna know what I'm talking about? Resident Evil is a huge hit for Capcom, so of course we keep getting multiplayer live service spin-off games over and over again despite literally all of them failing because no matter how bad they do, they're still live service games that only cost a fraction of a whole game to make and they know that they can get tons of microtransactions out of you. Mega Man 11 sold way above expectation. Capcom even put out a press release saying it was a huge surprise how well it sold. So of course, people want more Mega Man. So does that mean that we're finally going to get a brand new Mega Man X? Sure, if you want it to be a gotcha mobile game that you can pump infinite money into to try and get skins. People spent years saying they wanted Dino Crisis to come back. So did we get Dino Crisis back? No, we got the multiplayer live service dinosaur game that has like three different kinds of battle passes. Yeah, Capcom's microtransactions and live service practices have been terrible for years, and I'm kind of glad that people are finally waking up to this. But getting back to those Ninja Turtle costumes, here's how incompetent everyone involved in this whole thing was. 
I love the Ninja Turtles. Did I buy a $15 skin? God, no! But if they had been $5 each, and you could buy all four of them for $15, would I have bought all four of them for $15? Hell yes, I would have! And I know I'm not alone in saying that. So because of these super greedy practices, Capcom and Nickelodeon and everyone else missed out on money that they would have made if they had just charged less. Like, I know when it comes to microtransactions, they typically price them high because they're only aiming them at whales. I don't really know of any Street Fighter VI Avatar lobby whales out there. Like, even the biggest big spenders of them all probably looked at the idea of $60 for four Ninja Turtle costumes and said, nah, I'm good. But let's now talk about all the good announcements at EVO this year. We got our first look at the brand new Undernight in Birth. Killer Instinct was going to get an update after so many years of nothing, which we'll talk about later. We got our first look at the brand new Fatal Fury with the badass name Fatal Fury City of Wolves. And we got a very brief glimpse of the art style and so far, I'm digging it. I'll admit, I kind of feel like Fatal Fury and Art of Fighting should have more of a grungy, older film look since they're all about fights on the mean streets of Southtown, but hey, I can dig what they're going for here. It looks good. We also got some brand new DLC. Naj got added to KOF. Glad to see her return because I thought she was a cool character, but because she was added as DLC to KOF 14, and that was the first time she was ever in a KOF game, and none of the DLC characters in 14 got any story to them, it kind of left her a little bit empty in the game compared to everyone else, so I have been hoping that they would bring her back and give her some actual story. But the big DLC announcement was that Johnny was going to be coming to Guilty Gear's Tribe to kick off Season 3. I say this is the big announcement because, listen, Daisuke Ishiwatari is great. Love the guy. But when it comes to his games, it is clear that he cares a whole lot about that story. And that's a good thing. I'm glad that Daisuke is that passionate about this story. But it's also clear that their passion for the story helped to guide the DLC because they wanted to get all the characters that were important to the story in there first. But we're done with that now. All the story-related characters are here. So I had been hoping that as soon as all those characters were out of the way and starting with Season 3, we could get all the characters that people really wanted in the game. And the fact that Johnny was character number one? Yeah, that says to me I might have been right. This might just be the because you demanded it season. And speaking of things fans have been asking for, it was announced that starting with season three, various characters in Strive would be getting brand new moves. And this is the big thing I had been waiting for because listen, adding new characters is great, but once a game has been around for several years, you need to do something to make the older characters feel new too. Plus, people have been complaining about the lack of moves in Strive compared to older Guilty Gears and how that gives you fewer options in battle, so I've been wanting to see some kind of an update for a while now that just gives characters new moves, and it's finally happening. And in addition to that, they had a brand new mechanic where you can use half of your burst gauge for an offensive or defensive maneuver. Hell yeah, this takes Strive into whole new levels, and it's got me excited because it means this game is now becoming nutty in all the right ways. I love to see it. And one last official announcement from EVO, it was declared that from now on, August 6th would be EVO Day in Nevada. It doesn't really mean anything other than just being a big show of support, but you know what? Big shows of support are cool. This is awesome. Also worth knowing that they announced that next year EVO would be happening in July, so that means that the very first EVO Day won't have EVO on it, so that's a little bit weird, but yeah, whatever, still cool. Now there was one other announcement during EVO, but it didn't come from anyone at EVO. Or from any official developers. But how could I not mention it? We got a trailer for Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Community Edition. In case you've missed it over the past few years, the modding community has been doing everything in their power to breathe brand new life into Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3. And I don't just mean adding new skins. No, they have modded brand new characters into this game dozens of them, but they've been scattered about. You've had to go and pick and choose, but now all these modders are coming together and combining their work. We're getting them all into these big packages, and they're getting big reveal trailers for brand new characters. Essentially, the modding community is coming together to treat this game like it's an actual brand new release, and I love seeing that. Putting these mod characters together into single packages makes them easier to find, makes them more accessible, and promoting them like this makes the community feel more whole. Like if you wanted to host a modded Marvel tournament, 
people would be like, okay, well, which characters are included in this one? But now if you say Marvel Community Edition Tournament, everyone knows what you're talking about. Only real complaint I have right now is that there's clearly more Capcom fans than Marvel fans making these mods, which makes sense. Marvel vs. Capcom is a video game. Obviously, the people mine it are going to have more knowledge of the video game characters. But I would love to see more Marvel characters get added who aren't just characters from other MVC games or characters from the movies. Come on, guys, dig deep, get creative. There's some awesome stuff that you can pull from the other side of that roster. Also, if I can just get super greedy here for a second, if there's one other thing that I would ask to be modded into this game, figure out a way to create brand new arcade endings for these brand new modded characters. I love the crossover stuff in the arcade endings, so if there was any way that we could make special endings for the arcade runs of these brand new mod characters, ooh, oh, chef's kiss, oh, I would be so excited for that. And for the final release of August, something I never thought I would ever see happen, and on some level, kind of wish it didn't. A collection of old Taito games was released on the Switch, the Taito Milestones 2 collection. Why is this important? Because within this collection was an ancient beast, something prehistoric, Something that was now reawakened into modern times to wreak havoc once again. Yes, Dino Rex has now been ported to modern consoles. What a time to be alive! Now, for anyone who doesn't know, Dino Rex is infamous as one of the worst fighting games of all time with terrible controls, dated graphics, insane ideas that could only have existed back when people still didn't really know what a fighting game was, and most notably of all, this noise. Over and over again. But here's the thing. Dino Rex isn't just bad, it's hilariously bad. This is the fighting game equivalent of a movie that's so bad it's good, like this game should just come with an option to play it with the guys from Mystery Science Theater 3000 just plastered on the bottom of the screen. Like you won't enjoy yourself while you're playing it, you're going to have a horrible time, but everyone else watching you is going to be laughing their ass off. September comes rolling in with another healthy chunk of DLC. You got Aki in Street Fighter 6 providing a big dose of weird into the game and also doing the unthinkable of actually making Fong kind of cool. Then in JoJo's we got Leon. Again, he's from part 5 and I haven't seen part 5 yet, but I do know the meme about him and they turned that meme into his super, so you know what? Good on you, JoJo's All-Star Battle R. You did alright. Then you got Duo Lon returning to KOF, great to see him come back, he's a big fan favorite and his level 3 is now one of the sickest in the entire game. And lastly, Brawler got to add to DNF Duel, and unlike Spectre, I actually did get a chance to try him out. I played him during our big annual charity stream and I had a lot of fun with him. I also got to check out the brand new cube mechanic that they add to DNF Duel this year, and you know something? The cube is great! I love the variety that provides by letting each player choose what type of cube that they want to use. And if you can't tell, I also really like saying cube. Every time that I read that, I can't help but think of that line from The Simpsons. Hello, Mr. Burns' office. Is it about my cube? So yeah, I know I complained earlier about how DNF ran things, but I stand by my statement that DNF Duel is a really great fighting game. It's incredibly fun. Just a shame nobody else is playing it right now. But that was just the DLC for the month. When it came to brand new releases, September pulled double duty. First up, from the indie side of the FGC, Pocket Bravery finally launched. This is a game from Statera Studios, another Brazilian independent studio, and it's designed to resemble the old Neo Geo Pocket style fighters, while possessing its own completely original cast of characters and some really detailed but still accessible combat. This has arguably been the biggest indie fighting game release of the year, and that's good to see because this studio has been working on this game for a while now, and it shows. To start with the positives, the game feels really good to play, and it also feels like a great new central fighter. Fighting games have a wide range of styles, and this feels like it's right there in the middle. It's got a good mix of offensive and defensive skills, but it's not too heavy into either of them. It's got good speed that has some strong combo potential, but nothing too crazy and over the top. 
It's got a lot of the standard mechanics that you picture in fighting games. Super moves, EX moves, alpha counters, burst, but none of them are really all that special. There isn't really some kind of a unique twist on them, they just do what they do. But they do them very well. If you wanted to introduce someone to the fundamentals of fighting games, you know, give them some kind of a game that would show off the range of most things that you could expect to find in a fighting game, I think Pocket Bravery is a great choice for that. When I played the game, it felt like it was made by people who were massive old school fighting game fans, and they wanted to make something that would be a tribute to classic Street Fighter or King of Fighters games, and I think they nailed it. In fact, in a way, it kind of reminds me of what we were saying about the Breakers games from earlier in this video. Yeah, there's nothing really unique about the combat, it just does the combat really well. And I'm not just bringing up the Breakers games because show the protagonist of the Breakers games is a guest character in here. Who the hell thought that we would be talking about the Breakers games not once, but twice in 2023? I think Sho was in more releases this year than Ryu. That is a very weird thing to think about. But getting back to that comment, yes, I did compare it to a lot of older fighting games, but don't think that means you only get like four or five short little combos in here. No, no, no. As I said, this resembles older fighting games, but it still feels like it's been updated and adapted to the more modern playstyles that we've all become accustomed to. What I mean by that is that you can do some really crazy long combos in this game, but you never look at them and go, what the hell is even happening right now? No, you look at them and you say, ah, that goes into this, which then goes into this, and then you can do this EX move, and that then opens them up to this, and then you can finish it off with that. It all makes sense. It feels like combat that you can experiment with, but it feels like everything is also designed to work the way that it does. Also, I have to give the team behind this a lot of love because it is overflowing with personality. The moment the game starts and you see the unique artwork for every single option on the menu, including exit of all things, you can tell these creators cared about making something fun and loaded with standout characters. And some people might not dig the old school chibi sprites, but I get what they were going for and I think they made it work. And they do a lot with these sprites. The intros to every single stage is really detailed, and I love all the background characters that they snuck in there. Also, there's a story mode in here, and I figured it would be this short little throwaway thing, like basically an arcade ladder that just has some still images popping up and some dialogue between characters, which, hey, I'll take that. That's still better than nothing, and I appreciate the effort. But no, this thing is big, and it's got tons of artwork made just for this mode. I'll admit, not all the writing is great, and some of the characters are a bit much. Like, the main character's partner is this girl who is a big tech junkie, and man, they try way too hard to push her gamer side. Like, there's a moment where she just pulls out a Steam Deck just to tell you how cool it is, and I find that hilarious because Pocket Bravery doesn't run on the Steam Deck. And there's a gallery mode in here, and it's got tons of artwork. Not just official artwork, but even fan art that people made for the game. And that's great. That's some good, solid bonus content. But I do have to bring up this one thing. While we're on the subject of your gamer friend in here, I do have to point out that they include one bit of artwork of her, and it was... this. Guys? Statera? Listen, you can't actually include this in your game. Like, legally speaking, you can't. Pocket Bravery, I like you. I want you to succeed. You can't just straight up include Batman and Wolverine and Breaking Bad in your video game without getting official permission from the owners. Seriously, patch this out now before Warner Brothers or Disney finds out. You are an indie studio. You don't have the lawyers to fight them. But, okay, getting back to the topic at hand, weird questionable legal decisions aside, the team behind Pocket Bravery didn't have much, but they wanted to do everything that they could with what they had. It is so impressive how much content they packed into this game. They've got a story mode, unlockable characters, secret fights, unlockable special modes, tons of unlockable colors for your characters. I've said before, and I'll say it again, this is a game that was built on passion. Now let's talk about the negatives. 
At the time of this recording, the game still has some technical problems that it needs to iron out. Playing through it on Steam, I realized, yeah, there might be a reason why there isn't a release date yet for the console version. There's tons of screen tearing. Even after I altered the stats up, down, and all around, there was still plenty of screen tearing. But I also ran into occasional freezing, like, not crashing, just the screen would freeze up every now and again, but the game would keep going on, so the characters would just kind of teleport around. I will fully admit that could be my PC. I typically don't play video games on my PC. I mostly just play on console. So yeah, maybe my PC isn't all that up to date. But that being said, I have run stuff on here that is far more demanding than Pocket Bravery, and I've had zero problems with it, so... I don't know, I think it might be the game. And if you're playing through the single player content in here, the computer AI is, uh, not great. It's not like crazy hard or anything like that. No, it's actually kind of a coward. I don't know if I've ever run into a fighting game AI that just loves to walk away from you as much as this, and it kind of got a little bit irritating. Also, again, this one could just be me. I don't typically use my PC for fighting games all that often, so I'm not that used to playing them on Xbox controller, but the inputs seem really sensitive. It felt like if my fingers got even close to hitting the inputs for a super, a super would come out. But I do believe that these issues can be smoothed out pretty easily, and hopefully by the time that the console version releases, they'll all be ironed out and this thing will be running fine, and it'll be something special for your more traditional fighting game fans. But let's get to the big release of the month. The game that we didn't even know existed when the year began, although we all kind of assumed that it did. Mortal Kombat... Not 12! No. Mortal Kombat 1. Although I have heard the theory that because this is the second Mortal Kombat 1, that technically makes it Mortal Kombat 1... 2. If that was done on purpose, that's kind of brilliant. I can't even be mad about it. So, Mortal Kombat 1, a brand new installment is finally here. MK fans had to wait a whole four years for this game to come out. A statement that makes Street Fighter and Tekken fans roll their eyes so hard they go blind, but hey, it's finally here. And man, this is such a weird game to talk about. Just speaking purely about the combat, this might be my favorite Mortal Kombat. It's close between this and MKX, but this new cameo system is fantastic. It creates so much variety and leads to so much experimentation. This is easily my favorite Mortal Kombat to just take into training mode and just lab around for a bit just to see what I can do. I love seeing what this game is capable of but I kind of hate actually playing it. Okay, hold up, hear me out. There's two ways to think of this game, the online experience and the single player content. Mortal Kombat has always had some of the best single player content of any fighting game, and that's why the game sells so well. It realized that if you want to bring in the big audience, you need to appeal to that crowd that doesn't want to go online and fight total strangers. And the single player content in this game, I don't want to be too negative on it, but it just feels so tedious. Like, they kept the towers from the previous games, although now they're kind of off to the side. They're no longer the big shiny new feature. Although much to my chagrin, the random bullcrap that gets sent at you is just as bad as it was in the last game. Like, I appreciate the random bullcrap in the towers, it makes them different and interesting, but holy cow, it feels like starting with MK11, they cranked the random bullcrap knob so far to the right that they ripped it off and now they can't turn it back. But the brand new main feature of the single player content this time around is this big board game that you get to run around on, and boy do I hate this! You move around various boards, making your way to the boss of each stage before unlocking the next board, and then after going through all five or six of these boards, you can finally fight the big boss of the mode to unlock a brand new costume for a character. Okay, sounds fine. But it takes so long to walk from one spot to the next. 
The animation of walking from point A to point B is so sluggish, and you have to walk across so many spots in these campaigns, and it just drove me insane. Like, I want to stress, I'm not complaining about there being a lot of fights that you have to go through in these board games. No, 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 no. That makes total sense. That's content. That's good that they provide you with a lot of things to do in the single player mode. But the fact that you don't just instantly pop from one spot to the next, so you can just go from one fight directly into the next one, and instead you just have to watch your character slowly moving from spot to spot. Oh my god, I just wanted no part of that after a while. I finished every single one of these boards and took on the big final fight for season one, but I think I mentally checked out of this mode about halfway through the second board. And worst of all, there are things that you can unlock on the board or different paths that you can take, which is good, but there's no way for you to just see the entire map. Meaning, if you find yourself thinking, hey, I just got something that can unlock something else, I remember seeing it further back in the map, where was that thing back there that I can unlock? There's no way for you to just check. You have to just slowly walk all the way back through the board and hope that you remember where that unlockable was, and if you were wrong, then you gotta start walking all the way back in the other direction and check and see if it was over there. And Oh, did I mention that there are random fights that you can get into while you're slowly walking across this board? Which makes exploring for that unlockable take even longer. Everything about how these boards are set up just feel like they take too long. It's a good idea, but man, it needs some work. And speaking of needing some work, that brings us to the online. I've been told that a lot of the problems that I had with this game at launch have been fixed, but again, that's why I've been told. I'll admit, I stopped playing this in October because the online was driving me nuts. The connections were fine. Mostly. Okay, yeah, I'll admit, I actually had a ton of bad connections when I started playing this game, but the connections I had that worked were actually really good, so I don't know, maybe I just got really unlucky? Maybe I just ran up against a bunch of players who had horrible Wi-Fi? Who can say? But as for the actual performance of the game itself, this thing launched with tons of bugs. And I'm not just referring to the graphical bugs where a character's body parts will disappear or they'll start facing totally different directions in their wind poses. Yeah, what the heck happened on this game? Seriously, there is a story behind this game's development. But no, the bugs that I'm talking about here are things like, I went online and I found that suddenly combos that I could do with ease, I was having the hardest time getting to go through. And I'm not talking about long combos that require expert timing, I'm talking about like bread and butter three hit combos. I just couldn't do them online. And I thought, well, you know, it's probably me. I mean, yeah, sure, we talk about fighting games on here, but I will be the first to admit, I'm not exactly great at fighting games. We talk about them because we love them, not because we're good at them. But then tons of other people started saying that they also couldn't perform really basic combos. And then it turns out, yep, some combos were just bugged and they didn't work online or on the right side of the screen. Yeah, I've never heard of this one before, but the game also launched with a bug that made it so that some combos didn't work for player two. That's a, that's a new one, I'll, I'll admit. I've never run into that before. But those are bugs. Those are unknowns that pop up and aren't intended. But the stuff that really perplexed me were the things the developers did intend. It felt like the game was programmed by people who wanted to shake up the online formula, so they changed a lot of stuff that should not have been changed. Like, voice chat was on by default at launch, which on PC you could turn that off in the game. But on PlayStation, you had to maneuver your way through the PlayStation console menu to turn it off, and there was no way in-game to just say, oh yeah, turn that off, which would have been immensely simpler. So I saw so many people on PlayStation who didn't know how to turn that off, saying it was driving them nuts, and they didn't want to play anymore. And rightfully so! Why the hell would you make voice chat on by default and then not give people a way to turn that off in-game? Netherrealm, have you met competitive online gamers? 
who the hell at NetherRealm said, no, 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 the default should be the let the stoner on the other side of the country call you slurs while a baby cries in the background mode, and don't give people a way to turn that off either. Also, the vast majority of fighting games let you do best two out of three matches, but if you want to leave after one match, you can. MK1 at launch was best three out of five, and it was mandatory. You didn't get points for playing single matches, you only got points based on who won the full set. Meaning if you started a fight, you were locked in there until someone won three matches. Now from what I've been told, almost all of these problems have been addressed. Most of the bugs have been patched, the voice chat has a button now, the best three out of five has been changed to best two out of three. Although I was talking to some big MK players online about this, and apparently MK11 also launched with best three out of five, and people didn't like it, so they changed it to best two out of three. But that raises the question, if you already saw that people didn't like it in the last game, why did you switch it back for this game? But even if it's now best two out of three, I still have a big problem with the fact that you're locked into these full sets and you can't just do a match by match because, dude, we're not machines. Sometimes stuff comes up. Sometimes you have to use the bathroom. Sometimes your dog wants to go for a walk. Sometimes you have to help someone in your house with something. In other words, sometimes you play a match and then something comes up and you need to leave. And I don't know, I just think it kind of stinks that you don't have that option. Well, one person has that option. If you lose the match, then you can choose to leave. But again, that kind of stinks because sometimes you don't want to replay someone again even if you win. Like, let's say your opponent has a horrible connection, but you win. I don't think it's fair that that player now has you trapped in bad Wi-Fi hell and you can't escape. So yeah, my feelings on MK1 are pretty mixed, and I don't think I'm alone on this because I joked about it earlier, but MK fans were thirsty for this game. MK fans spent years anxiously awaiting the new game, hitting up Ed Boon on Twitter every second of every day asking about, trying to dissect his tweets for any cryptic clues he threw out there. And yet, when the game came out, well, it is selling well, of course it is. MK sells insanely well. This thing was always going to be a huge hit no matter what. But when Street Fighter VI came out, the online player base for Street Fighter V dropped by 90%. That's not an exaggeration, by the way, that's the actual numbers. And those numbers have remained down this entire time. Street Fighter VI is bringing in all the audience for the Street Fighter fan base. But when MK1 came out, MK11's player base on Steam dropped by 20%, and then immediately went back up to where it was. In fact, there have been multiple days where I've checked Steam charts and seen more people playing MK11 than MK1. What the hell is happening? This is the exact opposite of that Toy Story meme. Woody is flying back up into Andy's hand because he wants to play with him again. This is so bizarre because as I said, all I have heard from the MK player base over the last few years is, where's the next Mortal Kombat? And this year, NetherRealm said, here it is. And half of those fans said, nah, I'm sticking with the old one. If I had to take a guess, I'd say that doesn't have that much to do with the gameplay though. As I said, MK has a huge single player audience. There's a massive chunk of fans that don't want to go online. They just want to go into the towers and unlock cool prizes. And hey, there ain't a single thing wrong with that. That's what you want to do in a fine game? Good on you. You enjoy that game however you want. But I do think this explains these numbers. Yeah, as many problems as I had with the towers in MK11, they are definitely better than the single player content in MK1. And also, if you wanted to unlock something in MK11, that prize was right there on the tower. You beat the tower, you get that prize. In MK1, if you want to get a prize, then you have to get some coins and then shove them into a slot machine. And then just cross your fingers and pray. Yeah, that's not nearly as fun, and it's not really encouraging. You don't put some coins that you spent an hour earning into a slot machine only to unlock some concept art of a background character and then walk away from that saying, boy, I can't wait to do that again. So yeah, MK1, I think the game has something amazing there in the combat, but everything else just made me want to turn away. 
And damn, I didn't even mention the story mode. Okay, real quick, I'll just say this. I actually really dig seeing Liu Kang's new world. I was digging seeing these new interpretations of these characters. I actually love what they did with Reptile and Baraka. That's easily my favorite version of these two characters. And I couldn't wait to see how this reality would develop and how these characters would grow into their new roles. Then the story just says, nah, forget all that. Now this is a big tribute to the 3D era of these games, and also it's kind of a secret sequel to the last game, and you basically have to have the exact same fight that you had with Shang Tsung at the end of the last game, although now it doesn't mean nearly as much. So, uh, yeah, kind of a mixed bag, this story mode. But I'll save the rest of my thoughts for when we eventually do our Mortal Kombat retrospective, whenever the hell that happens. October Spooky Month is finally here, and thank god after last month, it's a lot easier. Yuya Fungami was added to JoJo's, Yuya is from part 4, and I love part 4, and yet I'll be honest with you, I do not remember Yuya at all. I remember his stand was called Highway Star, and that's all I got. And the only other release this month is that on Halloween, a brand new fighting game came out. Mastroscopy. I hadn't heard anything about this, I only know it existed because Epsilon Eagle on Twitter mentioned it, because if there is an obscure fighting game out there that nobody knows about, Epsilon Eagle will find it. But I checked it out and... Wow, this was nothing like what I was expecting. Imagine Darkstalkers, but made in Mexico in the 1970s. I'll get to what I mean by that in a second, but talking about the combat, it's a three-button fighter, attack, special attack, and guard. Super simple, however, the moves link together pretty well, and specials combo off of most of your attacks, and there's so many things that create ground or wall bounces, so while the combat might not be that deep, there's still a lot that you can do with it, and it feels pretty good. I mean, sure, there is that low-budget indie game jank to it. It's definitely got that we didn't have a full staff to check everything, so there's some funky floating and sliding in here in some combos. But when you start comboing someone up and down and then up again and back and forth, yeah, it feels fun, so who cares if it isn't that polished? That being said, yeah, it could be a bit more polished. It feels like this game is two or three patches away from being great, because in addition to the little slipperiness in the movement, I did run into several bugs. Like, at one point, one of the character's normal attack buttons just caused them to start throwing over and over again, and I couldn't make it stop. So, yeah, it needs a bit more time in the oven. This game came out on Halloween, and you can tell they wanted to race it out there so that way it could hit that specific date. But as for the tone and style of the game, Mastroscopy was made by Mexican game studio Oribe Wari Games and they wanted to make something that would be a tribute to science fiction and horror films from Mexico from the 1950s to 1970s. Just that golden era of drive-in movie goodness. So every character is a parody of a monster or a horror movie trope. When we did our Halloween Builder roster this year, I brought up El Santo, and I got so many positive responses from people who were excited for El Santo. So I'm just gonna let y'all know right now, there is an El Santo parody in this game. But as a big Darkstalkers fan who wants more horror-themed fighting games, I love this! They've got werewolves and mummies and fish people and vampires, and you can tell some of them were inspired by Darkstalkers and other bits of pop culture outside of Mexican horror films. Like, this little demon is just Lilith with Akuma's big glowing back tat on her. And there's this vampire in the game who has a Dio stand? And I'm not just bringing that up because I've mentioned JoJo so many times in this video, I don't know how to stop myself. No, like he actually does one of the poses that Dio does in the old Capcom JoJo's fighting game. But when it comes to its tribute to the old horror films of the time, it goes beyond just the cast. There's two versions of each stage, a black and white stage and a Technicolor stage. And the black and white looks like grainy old black and white films, including having super washed out white colors, which makes it horrible for competitive gameplay, but great for capturing the look of the source material. You wanna know how dedicated they were to making this theme? There is an option for 3D in the game. And when I saw that, I had no idea what that could possibly mean. Like, these are already 3D models, does it move the camera around? What do you mean by 3D? So I just turned it on, and it instantly put the blue and red old movie 3D filter over everything. Again, horrible for competitive gameplay, but it's fun. And you wanna know the crazy thing? The 3D actually works. I've got an old pair of 3D glasses, so I put them on, and sure enough, the game was now in 3D. That's nuts. So kudos to Oribe Wari Games. You set out to make a passion project unlike anything else, and as a fan of old monster movies, I salute you. So that's it for October, finally a relatively easy month. 
So now we have to balance it out with November, the fighting game news apocalypse month. Okay, let's get the rapid fire stories out of the way. KOF 13 Global Match, a version of the beloved KOF 13, now with rollback netcode, was released. Glad to see this amazing game finally has good netcode, and is continuing the legacy of one game from each saga in KOF getting a re release with rollback. KOF 13, KOF 98, KOF 2002, we have them all now. Speaking of KOF, KOF 15 at Hinako is the final DLC character of Season 2, and. Okay. I know Hinako has her fans. I know that because when I asked for news stories for this video, someone told me to be sure to mention Hinako about three times, so yes, she has her fans. This is so not the final character they should have gone out on. You want the final roster spot to be someone big and jaw-dropping. Hinako is a fun character who has some fans. This should have been, like, the second or third character for this season, not the big one to close everything out. Then more DLC, Omni-Man was added to Mortal Kombat 1, our first guest character, and the one to kick off this season's dark superhero theme. I like Invincible, but I don't know, I'm just not interested in this or honestly any of the other DLC characters. Then the most shocking DLC of all, Gigabash added Ultraman characters. Gigabash is an amazing, fun party fighting game. It's the perfect fighting game for playing some casual couch co-op, but there's also tons of really inventive single player content. I've got a video on coming up next year, so I'll go into more details about it then, but I love this game. Huge recommendation from me if you just want something to play with your friends. However, we haven't heard anything from them in about a year, and I was worried it was all over. But then, out of nowhere, Ultraman got added to the game, meaning you now have a game where Ultraman can fight Godzilla. This game is amazing, the team behind it is really passionate and dedicated, and I am so glad it's still got life behind it. Now I know that I said I wasn't going to cover any of the Tekken 8 announcements, simply because if I did, then this video would be half me talking about upcoming character reveal trailers. However, I have to cover at least one of them. I have to give Tekken at least some time in the spotlight, and if there is one character reveal from Tekken 8 who took the world by storm, it was the final character reveal, the brand new fighter, Reyna. She's cool, she's stylish, she's got a great look to her, she's got a badass take no prisoners attitude, which I love, but none of that is why anyone is talking about her. No, in the last Tekken, Heihachi Mishima, one of the biggest baddies in fighting game history, was defeated by his son and tossed into a volcano, killing him for good. So say hello to Heihachi's long lost daughter. Yes, one of the running gags in Tekken is that Heihachi has tons of kids, either by blood or by adoption. Heck, this isn't even the first time in the series that a brand new character appeared and revealed themselves to be a long lost kid of Heihachi's. So Reyna is the newest character to be thrown into the madness of the Mishima family feud, and I have many questions about what this could mean for the future. I mean, Tekken 8 is supposed to be the end of the Mishima blood feud, the war in this family that has been raging since the very first game. But how do you end a storyline that's been building for 8 games? Does that mean Tekken 9 could be a brand new fresh start with a brand new focus for the story? Or is Reyna going to pop up and say, Hey Jin, nice job taking out Kazuya, but the Mishima Zaibatsu is mine. Who knows, but I'm excited to find out. Now going from brand new stories to... No new stories. Yeah, that wasn't the best transition. Them's Fighting Herds is a really fun and detailed fighting game that has built up a very dedicated fanbase and it launched with part one of a story mode that was pretty big with a lot of variety to the gameplay and fun boss fights. But it ends on a cliffhanger and the developer said, Oh don't worry, there's more coming. We just wanted to launch with something, but as soon as the rest of the story is done, we're going to put it out there. Yeah, guess what? In November, they put out a statement that sadly, they were done making content. They were going to finish the last two DLC characters and then production on the game would come to a close. So yeah, sad news for the Them's Fighting Herds fans. I'm actually wondering if they would have been better off working on the story mode rather than the DLC and the console version of the games because, well to put it bluntly, this game has a lot of single player fans interested in it. So I'm wondering if focusing on that single player content would have had a bigger impact on the game because, no offense, as passionate as the Them's Fighting Herds fans are, I haven't seen anyone talking about the DLC after the first character of the season came out, and that was mostly people just saying, Hey, 
there's DLC now. Like when Texas dropped, I saw people cheering, hey, this game has a season of new characters coming. That's awesome. And then I never saw anyone talk about it ever again. I'm not trying to kick a horse when it's down, but I do think they would have been better off focusing on that single player content and then releasing the console version, really advertising and hyping up that single player mode. So that way you could have gotten that audience rather than trying to re-energize the competitive base. But then again, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes. Maybe they wanted to focus on that story mode more than the DLC, but they ran out of money, and the story mode was supposed to be free, so they couldn't really use that to bring in more income, so they had to create a season pass of DLC to try and raise the funds in order to make that story mode. Again, I don't know, it's just kind of a sad situation all around. Although, speaking of breathing life into an older game, this month the unthinkable happened. Remember over a year ago when at EVO 2022 it was announced that Dragon Ball Fighters was going to get rollback netcode? One of the best fighting games out there right now with one of the worst netcodes of all time was finally going to fix that one huge glaring problem. Then remember how they didn't bring it up again for like over a year? and everyone thought they just dropped it and forgot about it? Well, guess what? The rollback is real. They dropped a beta for it out of nowhere. And I'll admit, I didn't play it because it was on the PC version, and as I've brought up several times, I'm just not the biggest fan of playing fighting games on PC. I prefer playing them on consoles. But I did watch tons of footage of other people playing it, and sure, it still needs a little fine tuning, but everyone seemed to agree that for the majority of the time, it was amazing. But we're not done. No, not even close. Here's a rundown of a few other announcements that came out in November. If you were curious to check out Dino Rex, but didn't want to spend money on the full title release, Arcade Archives released the game by itself on the Switch. Meaning that in 2023, we got not one, but two ports of Dino Rex. But I still can't get a port of Rival Schools no matter how hard I ask for it. The world truly isn't fair sometimes. But then sometimes it is fair, because this month Killer Instinct Anniversary Edition dropped. We finally got an update to Killer Instinct, one of the best fighting games of all time. There is finally some new life being breathed into it. Now, I love Killer Instinct, but I have always played it super casually, so I cannot tell you how much these balance patches really impact the game. I'm just glad people are talking about KI again. And I'm hoping this was a huge success for them because I want even more content for this game. One of the biggest problems with KI 2013 is that at the end of its life, they started adding ultimate combos to the characters. Big finishing moves to end the match in style. But not every character got one because the game's development came to an end before they were finished. If this update is a success for KI, I am hoping that they can go back and finally add them in here for all the remaining characters. I know that's a long shot, but I would love to see it happen. Also, the game launched a free version on Steam, so if you don't have an Xbox and you are curious about this game, then you can finally check it out risk-free. However, there is one problem that I do have with this update. They want the game to now be rated T for teen, and hey, I understand the logic there. You make it T, you can potentially bring in a bigger audience, I get that. But what this means is that they had to stop selling on Xbox the big collector version of the game because that version included the original two killer instincts from the 90s. And they can't go back and patch the M-rated content out of that one. Which means the only place to legally buy the original two killer instincts is gone. Again, I get you wanting to make a T-rated version, but why not just break up the collection then and sell the original games as their own thing? Anytime older games get taken off of digital stores, it's a big hit for game preservation, and it's frustrating to see that happen as a result of this update. Then, speaking of things people were waiting for but came with a tiny bitter taste attached, Street Fighter VI finally added new costumes for all their characters. Well. I say finally like it had been so long. This game has only been out for a few months, but man, people were thirsty for those costumes. I kept seeing people say Street Fighter V got new costumes every single month. Yes, it did, but what you're forgetting is that those costumes in Street Fighter V were terrible. 
They just slapped together whatever they could as fast as they could because they needed something to sell. They looked like you just shoved Play-Doh into a press and whatever came out was the new costume. These costumes, on the other hand, look amazing. They actually look like the developers spent time and effort on them. I am totally fine with them taking a few months to release brand new costumes if they look this good. What I am not fine with is the pricing. Now, before this game came out, I saw people saying, these costumes should only cost two or three dollars, and I have zero idea what Capcom you've been paying attention to for the past few years, because ain't no way in hell that was going to happen. Capcom has been charging 25 bucks for avatar costumes in this game. Yeah, just for the random junk that you can put on your in-game avatar, and yet for the main attraction, you expected their heart to magically grow three times its size and they would realize the error of their ways? Yeah, fat chance of that happening. So I went into this expecting the costumes to be like 20 bucks a pop, $10 minimum. But they were six, so okay, you know what? Better than expected. Here's the problem though. For starters, you can't buy a bundle. Meaning if you want each costume, you have to buy each costume. Tolling out to over $100. Ain't no way one pack of costumes for a roster should come out to over a hundred dollars. But here's the other big problem. As I have said, Capcom has fully embraced microtransactions and live service tomfoolery, and this tactic is straight out of the scummiest mobile games playbook. You can't buy these costumes with money. No, you can't just pay six dollars for a costume. You have to buy them with the in-game currency of Fighters Coins. Can you buy $6 worth of coins? No! You can only buy them in $5 increments. Meaning if you want that $6 costume, you have to buy $10 worth of coins. That is sleazy. Like, I would almost prefer that the costumes were $7 because at least then it wouldn't be as obvious you just came in here and said, what's the minimum amount of coins that you can buy? go one dollar higher. And the sad thing is, this isn't going to stop. People complain about the turtle skins and you know something? They didn't buy them. And good. Glad everyone put their foot down on that one. But everyone caved on these skins. I have seen everyone buying them up. And I can't blame you, I play Zangief, and Library Geef looks amazing! I understand, I'm not made of stone, I understand why you would buy those fighter coins even if you knew this was a broken system. It just sucks because it means we can expect more of this from Capcom in the future because they know they can get away with it. But moving on to brand new games, quite a few dropped this month. Naruto Cross Baruto Ultimate Ninja Storm Connections released. Every time I think they're done making Ninja Storm games, there's one more that comes out. I'll be honest with you, I never got into the Ninja Storm games. I did like Naruto back in the day, but I'm just not the biggest fan of arena fighters. Although I will say, the game looks gorgeous. These are always some of the most spectacular looking anime fighters. If you ever want a feast for your eyes, just load up a compilation of super moves from these games and enjoy. Then Checkmate Showdown released. This is a game that asks, hey, what if we combine chess with a fighting game? Basically, you play chess like normal, but anytime that one of your big name pieces, basically anything other than a pawn, ends up fighting another name piece, it then turns into a fighting game. Meaning you can try and overtake a spot, but then if the opponent is a better fighter than you, then they'll end up beating you. It's a wild idea. I feel like every couple of years someone makes a game that it's chess, but brutal, or some other kind of a twist on chess. And hey, I'm down. I love any fighting games because it's where people can keep the crazy experimental nature of the 90s fighting game scene alive, and stuff like this proves it. Then Nick All-Star Brawl 2 released, literally just one year and a month after the original game came out. Man, talk about keeping the spirit of the 90s alive. They turned a DLC season into a brand new game. Well, okay, that's a little unfair of me. I know a lot of people have been asking why they made this a new game and not just a season pass, and the reason is simple. Nobody would have played the game if it was just a new season. Listen, I'm going to talk more about this when we get to December, but giving fighting games seasons of DLC characters is a great way to extend the life of a game, to keep players coming back for something new, and to keep them talking about it. But there comes a point where the game is just done and no amount of DLC is going to save it. There comes a point where you can't breathe new life into something that isn't there anymore. 
And if the first Nick game had launched in a far more polished state, it launched with more content, if it had voice acting at release, people probably would have been willing to stick around. But yeah, the original launch was just botched too hard. And I won't make it clear, that ain't Ludosity's fault. It's not the fault of any of the developers. They all did the best they could with what they had. But Nickelodeon gave them nothing but a sack full of nickels to make this game with. This was one of the cheapest big fighting game releases in recent history. It played well. The game was actually fun from a mechanical standpoint, but it didn't have the budget to make the game that people wanted. It didn't have the single player content that a Smash clone should have. And it didn't have the personality that a big crossover needs. So yeah, if this game wanted to come back, it had to have a fresh start. A brand new jumping on point. So, I agree, they should have just done a sequel. But if they were going to do that, they couldn't just pull the football away from us again. They had to prove, no, 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 this time it's different. And you know what? Yeah, this time it's different. This is an insane glow up. There's more characters, and the characters now have more abilities, including super moves. They look better and have so much more personality in all of their animations. I will admit, I wish the game was just a tad faster, like 10%. But for the most part, yeah, I'm enjoying the gameplay. But the big draw of this game is all the single player content. I've seen a lot of Smash clones. There have been a lot of big properties out there who thought that they could grab that crown. But all of them fall short of what they're aiming for. But this one gets kind of close. And I'm not saying that this game is on the same level as Smash. No, it's not. But this is the first Smash clone that I can remember playing that felt like the people behind it actually got it. There's so much that you can do in this game. There's mini games like Break the Target. Uh, I mean, Pop the Balloon. Yeah, it's totally different. It's not related at all. Then there's items and currencies and power-ups that all come straight from Nick's history. Then there's boss fights against unique enemies. And there's a boss rush mode where you can fight all the bosses back to back. I've been asking Smash Ultimate to add this feature into their game for years, ever since the game first came out. And yet this is the game where that actually happened. That shows that the people who made this game weren't just aware of what Smash was and why Smash was popular, they actually paid attention to Smash and asked, what is this missing? What could we add to this game? And there's a huge subspace emissary style campaign mode where you unlock new players, decorate your base, and interact with other characters, with certain fighters having unique dialogue with these NPCs. You know, stuff you want in a crossover game. I have to repeat myself. The best compliment that I can give this game is that somebody actually got the appeal of a Smash crossover fighter. Unfortunately, there is one huge problem with the single player content. Maybe it's just on the PlayStation, heck, maybe it was just me. But the AI in this game is kind of buggy. There were multiple times where the opponent would just stop moving or start vibrating like they were trying to move but didn't know what direction to go. And I love that they add bosses in here, but holy cow, some of these bosses just stand there and do nothing. I went through the arcade mode on various difficulties, and the final boss always just stood there for like 10-15 seconds straight before it decided to do anything else, and I could just wail on it that entire time. Then it would do an attack, and then it would freeze up again for another 10 seconds. So yeah, this game has some bugs and it needs to be fixed, but with the last game, I couldn't really recommend it to anyone other than hardcore platform fighter fans. But this game? If you're a platform fighter fan, pick it up. But even if you don't care about that at all and you're just a huge Nickelodeon fan, yeah, this is great. It finally feels like the game you were asking for. And the final news story from November, we've all known for a while that Rivals of Aether has been working on a sequel using three-dimensional models rather than sprites. Well, this month they launched a Kickstarter for the game with a goal set of 200,000, and they ended up bringing in over a million. Big congrats to those guys. Love to see that kind of support. Although I do have to question some of these stretch goals. Most of the goals were adding characters to the base roster, which is great, but the stretch goal for one and a half million was ranked matches available at launch, and the goal for two and a half million was arcade mode available at launch. And listen, I know those things are hard to program and they take time and money, I totally get that. But I don't know, it feels like those should have been a little bit higher priority on that list. It feels a little bit weird playing out a fighting game with no rank matches and no arcade mode at launch. But we've still got about a year before this thing is released, so who knows what could possibly change in that time. 
And now, moving into our final month, going from one upcoming platform fighter with animals to another, a brand new game called Combo Devils was announced out of nowhere, and apparently it's pretty close to release already. I know nothing about this game other than that it's a platform fighter and it actually looks pretty darn good. It's up on Steam, so if you check it out and you think it looks interesting, then go ahead and wishlist it. I feel like a lot of people know this, but in case you don't, wishlisting a game on Steam tells Steam whether or not it should promote that game. So if you want to help out upcoming indie games, make sure that you wishlist them, even if you don't have any plans on eventually buying them. Then another new announcement nobody saw coming. The Rumblefish. The Rumblefish. Rumblefish Plus, baby! Yes, an enhanced version of the original Rumblefish was announced and then suddenly dropped in like a week. Now, I'm not saying me doing a Rumblefish retrospective at the beginning of the year made this happen. Because it absolutely did not make this happen. They actually hinted at this over a year ago. Yeah, when this got announced, I got so many people reaching out to me and saying, Yo, could your retrospective have made this happen? And guys, I'm flattered you all think I have that kind of power. But I assure you, I do not. No, when the Rumblefish 2 was released last year, Limited Run Games did a deal where if you ordered a physical version of the game, it would come with a code for the digital version of the first Rumblefish. And I ordered it because they made it sound like this could possibly be the only way that you could even get this digital version of the first Rumblefish. Cut to a year later when I've completely forgotten I ordered that game and suddenly it arrives in the mail the exact same week the Rumblefish Plus went up on sale. Yeah, they were always going to do this, but hey, it's happening. Glad people have a chance to finally check out the original, and also glad they're not doing the sleazy cut all the bosses from the game and sell them as DLC thing that they did with Rumblefish 2. That was just awful. Don't ever do that again. Then we got a handful of new DLC characters this month. Battle Mage got added to DNF Duel. I'll go ahead and repeat myself, DNF Duel is a good game, and I'm glad that it still gains support. Although, considering how low the numbers remain, and the fact that this month it was also announced that the developers 18 would start working on a Hunter x Hunter fighting game, yeah, I don't think a Season 2 is likely. Then Quan Chi got added to Mortal Kombat. Always feels weird when a character that you could fight against in the story mode gets added as DLC, but... Hey, so many fine games do that now, not much of a point to complain about. Quan Chi looks pretty cool now, he's always had one of the goofier designs in the game in my opinion, but over the past few installments, they've slowly made him more of a badass, and I've seen some people doing some pretty impressive stuff with him online, so I'm glad to see that people are enjoying him so far, but never mind that stuff, time for the real DLC MVP of the month. Running Owl joins Fight of Animals. Yes, just when we needed it most, Fight of Animals, the fighting game based around animal memes, announced a brand new character would be joining the game three years after its last update. Three years after the last DLC character got added, Fight of Animals got brand new content for free. I don't know what the guys at Digital Crafters are doing, but I approve. Keep it up, you glorious madmen. Okay, okay, in all seriousness, I'd say probably the biggest DLC character of the month was actually Elfelt returning to Guilty Gear Strive. This is easily one of the most requested characters for the game since day one. Which again, makes me think that we are now at that point where Daisuke is like, I've put in all the characters that I want for the story, just add whoever everyone else asked for. Speaking in terms of her lore and her background, I love what they did with Elfelt. She's now a screamo death metal rocker. I love it, I approve. And in terms of the combat, she is now completely different from before. I'll admit, I never put any time into Elfel and XR, but even having never touched her in the last game, I can take one look at this gameplay and say, oh yeah, that is nothing like before. But here's the weird thing. Nobody really seems to mind. With every single other Strive character, people have complained about all the tools that they took away from them, how much they changed about the character. But here's Elfel, who is completely different from before. She actually reminds me a lot more of Noelle from Blaze Blue. And yeah, I haven't seen anybody complaining about it. Which tells me two things. Either people prefer Elfelt like this and they really enjoy the changes they made to her, or most of the people who were asking for Elfelt to return just thought she was cute. They just wanted her in a game again, they didn't care how she played. And you know something? Nothing wrong with that. You like a character and you want them to come back just because you think the character is neat? Cool, that is a totally valid reason to request a character. And the people who are playing her have said some really positive stuff about her, so... Yeah, looks like we have a win for Guilty Gear. We finally have a new character added that nobody complained about. 
Everyone liked it. Awesome. But here's what I'm really excited for. Guilty Gear also announced it would be adding a team mode, a three versus three option. We know nothing about this so far, just that it's on the way. Now, there's two ways that I can see this going. Either it's a King of Fighters mode where you have three characters, one loses, then the next character comes out, or they could be going nuts with this and making it like Marvel or Fighters where you can swap between the characters in the middle of a match. And a KOF mode should be fairly easy to implement. That doesn't seem like something that would take a ton of time to make. So I'm hoping the fact that this is in development means we are going with the wacky marble method. Because this is Guilty Gear, it lives and dies by how over the top and wacky it can be. And as I've said, many people have had several complaints about Guilty Gear Strive, but I feel like they've done a lot to correct a lot of the problems that people have with this game. But one problem that people still have with it is that the damage is way too high. And I agree with everybody on that. They need to tone down the damage. But you know what other games have really high damage? Marvel and Fighters. Because when you're going out there with three characters at once, yeah, you want to do a whole lot of damage to each other. So it feels like this mode would be perfect for Guilty Gear Strive. Turning Strive into a team-based Marvel Fighters game could make it explode all over again, so I am crossing my fingers hard that that is what they have planned. Also kind of hoping that the game adds more single-player content, because as long as we're talking about our Guilty Gear wishlist, uh, yeah, Arxis, this game is kind of barren even after three years. Come on, man. But that brings us to the final bit of news to talk about for the year. Grand Blue Fantasy vs. Rising was released. Yes, the original Grand Blue released in early 2020. It was a brand new fighting game from the visual masterminds at Arc System Works, all based on a browser game that I had never heard of, and I'm still not 100% sure what it is, but it's insanely popular, so hey, I'm always in favor of popular things getting turned into fighting games. However, the game was criticized at release for having pretty basic, slow-paced, defensive heavy combat, and for only having 11 characters at launch, one of the lowest starting rosters of any recent major game. But most importantly, it was criticized for having horrible online. Right at the start of the pandemic, when everyone couldn't play in person and could only play online. Well, the game stuck around for several years, never getting a huge crowd, but keeping a stable audience. And I tried getting into the game a few times, but it just never stuck with me for all the reasons that I just listed off before. But this year, they decided to put out a new version of the game. Now with all the DLC characters included, as well as a handful of brand new fighters, brand new single player content, brand new mechanics that lean more heavily into offense, and most importantly, rollback netcode to help the game play silky smooth online. And the game is only a few weeks old at the time of this recording, but damn, I am addicted to it. I am having so much fun with this game now. The online works great. The basic combat can still feel a little bit simple, but all the new stuff they add in there lets you spice it up in a variety of ways. And it looks even better than it did before. I haven't tried out any of the new single player stuff yet, but that's kind of a testament to how good the gameplay in Netcode is that I haven't wanted to stop playing the game online. And each character has a rewards progress chart where you can earn various prizes based on how much you play them and the speed at which you level them up is perfect. It's just quick enough for me to say, oh, I'm almost at the next prize. Well, I'll play one more match. Oh, wait, if I do two more matches, then I could possibly unlock this thing. Yeah, I'll keep going a little bit longer. Other games have this too, like Mortal Kombat 1 and Killer Instinct, and that's great. More fighting games need to do this. Reward people for playing your characters. It's a great way to encourage them to try out new characters so they can unlock more stuff or just to encourage them to keep trying the game if they might be frustrated with it. Fighting games take a lot of time and energy to really get invested in them. This keeps players invested in them. But out of all the games that have attempted this, Grand Blue feels the best. It doesn't feel like there's any grind to it, at least not in the first few hours. I'm sure if I try and max a character out, then yeah, it might get a little bit rough. But again, I've been playing this for a while now and that grind still hasn't kicked in yet. And just like with Nick All-Stars, I know someone out there is going to say, well, why wasn't this just DLC? Because that wouldn't have worked. As I said earlier, sometimes when a game has been around for a while, no matter what DLC you add, it's not going to bring that audience back. That time has passed, and the only way to bring them in is to add a ton of new content all at once and then treat it like it's a brand new game. 
And based on the numbers I've been seeing, yeah, it looks like that worked. So awesome. I'm so glad that this game is getting that second chance. I'm so glad that it's finding that audience. And I'm so glad I now get to be in that audience. The Grand Blue Bus finally stopped long enough for me to hop on, and so far, this is a fun ride. And just a few weeks before recording this, we got our big final announcement of the year. Grand Blue revealed a couple of its upcoming DLC characters, and one of them is going to be 2B from Nier Automata. I mean, it makes sense. This is a super anime aesthetic game, and 2B appeals to that anime audience. But it is still crazy to me. It's like this game is taking the countless crossovers that mobile and browser games like Grand Blue are known for, and now they're going to start doing it in their fighting game spinoffs. And you know what? I'm down. Let's get wild with this. Also, if I had a nickel for every time that 2B was in a fighting game made by Okubo with a character named Siegfried, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. But there you have it, everyone. That is everything from December, and that is everything from the 11 months before that. That is all the fighting game news of 2023. I don't think I missed a single thing. No, wait! There was one more character added to JoJo's in December. I have no idea who this is. Okay, now that is all the updates and news and releases and DLC and everything else fighting game related from 2023. It was an incredible year with every single month jam packed with something to talk about. What were your favorite new games of the year? Favorite new DLC characters? Favorite reveals and stories of the year? Let me know all of that and more in the comments down below, or find me on all the socials at Thorgy's Arcade. As I said, I've been thinking about doing a video like this each year for a while now, so let me know if you want me to keep this up and make this an annual tradition. And I want to close out by saying a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us this year, who has subscribed, who has liked and commented. You guys have been helping this channel grow. Big thanks to everyone who shared all of our videos around. Seriously, I really appreciate that, and it does help get this channel out there. And a big thank you to our patrons. Their names are scrolling up on the screen right now. And if you want to join them and get some behind the scenes bonuses, follow the link in the description down below. Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. I hope that your holidays have been good. I hope that your New Year's has been great. And I hope the next year is even better. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there and come back next time.